All right, we come in our study of soteriology, the study of salvation, to the doctrine of the assurance of salvation. Last time we dealt with appropriation, which has to do with how do you appropriate or apply salvation to you. In other words, how do you get saved? Our text was Acts chapter 16, where the question was asked, what must I do to be saved? And we went through some things regarding repentance and receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So this time we want to deal with assurance of salvation. It's good that you know the way of salvation. This is what the Bible says. You are a sinner. You can't save yourself. You're headed for hell. If you don't turn from yourself, your religion, your pride, whatever you're trusting, your unbelief, if you don't turn, have a change of mind, and turned and received Jesus Christ by faith, trusting in His blood atonement, that He died on the cross for your sins, that His sacrifice was satisfactory to God, that He rose again from the dead. If you don't believe that and trust Him as your personal Savior, you can't be saved. But it's good to know that, but if you, if you know that in your head, but if you don't have that assurance and peace in your heart, it's no good just to have it in your head. So we want to deal with assurance of salvation and so you can't help anybody get to heaven if you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven yourself now our text will be first john chapter five. First john chapter number five a great proof text for the assurance of salvation oftentimes you'll talk to people and you'll ask them well if you were to die today where would you go heaven or hell and they'll say well i don't know nobody can know for sure They'll say, well, I guess I'll find out when I die. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the New Testament teaches. The New Testament teaches, after the resurrection of Christ, that if someone puts their faith in Christ, they can know beyond any doubt that they're going to heaven. Look in 1 John chapter number 5. Come down to verse number 9. We'll start in verse number 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Verse 13, look at it. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So, the Bible teaches a no-so salvation. You can't help anyone spiritually in, to get to heaven if you don't know you're going to heaven. It's preposterous when you think about some of these churches that, that do not teach the plan of salvation correctly or the churches that do not teach eternal security and assurance of salvation. It's preposterous to think that you have all these congregants coming into the church, they're sitting in front of the preacher, listening to a man who doesn't even know for sure that he's going to heaven, tell them how they're supposed to go to heaven. That's, that's really sad. The Bible gives us a no-so answer. Now, so you want to understand this. Now, we're going to have three, basically, areas of concern, two parts of the chart that you're going to see that we're going to deal with, but there's really three areas of concern. And uh, one of them is objective, and the other two are subjective. The objective area of concern deals with fact. In other words, what does God say about the salvation of a sinner who trusts Christ? Does God teach that that salvation is eternal? And that person cannot go to hell for any reason whatsoever. Okay, we're going to examine the fact of that teaching. And then we have the subjective part, which has to do with the feeling. And this is where I ask the question, do you know that you're saved? You may have all the facts up here, but you do not know it, or you have doubts. And so that's the subjective part. And the other part of that is applying the facts, and that is where we come to faith. We spoke about that last time. Without faith, the Bible says, Hebrews eleven six, it is impossible to please Him. You have to have faith. You have to apply the facts by faith, and then you can have the assurance, the feeling. Now, there are different kinds of people. I'll give you basically, basically uh, two different 
three different kinds of people. There are those people that aren't saved. They're just lost. They're not saved. They're on their way to hell. They're not on their way to heaven. Then you have the people that are saved and they are sure about it. They know that they've passed from death into life. They know that they're a new creature in Christ. They know that they have eternal life and they're going to heaven. You couldn't talk them out of it for anything. They know that they know that they know. And then you have the third group who are saved, but they have doubts. They're saved, but they do not have that assurance of salvation. And oftentimes it's because of false doctrine that's crept into the churches. As we've mentioned some before, we've dealt with some theological issues that deal with church issues because people attend churches, they hear things from preachers, congregation goes out, they work with people in those churches, they say, yeah, well the Bible says if you fall away you can't get your salvation back. Well the Bible says you must endure to the end to be saved. Well the Bible says if you're a murderer you can't have eternal life. And they give verses and they give opinions and they give things from scripture and they cause people to doubt because theologically there is a position within the evangelical church that teaches you can't have assurance of salvation. So we want to make sure we cover the Bible truth regarding this. I'm not going to deal so much this time regarding the theological issues. They would basically be divided into what we call Arminianism and Calvinism. The Arminius, Arminianism, ancient Arminianism, comes from a, a, a theologian named uh, Jacob Arminius. And he proposed that a person could lose their salvation. But the difference between uh, classic Arminianism and what you have with John Wesley is, John Wesley would say once you lost your salvation, you could repent of that sin and you could get that salvation back. And of course you have that prevalent idea in a lot of uh, contemporary evangelical churches today. The other side of the coin is Calvinism that teaches in the extreme forms perseverance of the saints. In other words, you know that you have assurance of salvation because you persevere until the end. The last uh, point in the TULIP acronym for Calvinism, T-U-L-I-P, P would stand for perseverance of the saints. So they believe in eternal security, but not like the Bible teaches. They believe you know that you're one of the elect because you have good works. So really you're not going to know until you get to the end of your life whether you endured until the end and you had enough fruit to match your salvation to prove that you were quote unquote really saved. So major problems in the theological realm. The best thing to do is just to get in the Bible and let the Bible clear up this idea of eternal security and salvation. So what is salvation? Salvation means to save or to deliver. In a broader term, it encompasses God's work by which man is redeemed from sin and saved from hell. God's work, okay? So the idea of faith and works comes in and you begin to think, okay, if I'm saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then if it's God's work and it's not my work, then why would I think that I could have enough works in order to keep my salvation? So therefore, I am secure in Him because if He saved me, my salvation is contingent upon God, His power, and His promises. Then the idea of forgiveness of sins, do you have full forgiveness or just partial forgiveness? You see, when Christ died on the cross, did He die for all of your sins, past, present, and future? And I guess really the question is this. Is God really an eternal God, and does He have an eternal salvation? And so when you begin to ask these questions, you have to realize that you never repented, as we mentioned in our last study, of all your sins anyway. You can't remember all your sins, and if you did, you would, your mind would probably cave in on itself. God has forgiven you of all your trespasses by the blood of Christ when you put your faith in His atonement and His sacrifice and you've been forgiven. It's done. It is finished. Are you saved? Do you have this matter settled? Now, the new versions of the Bible pervert this idea in, in a couple of passages. I'll just give you these. I mentioned the definition of salvation for a reason, because it's God's work by which man is redeemed from sin and saved from hell. So if we ask someone, are you saved? 
You say, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm saved. I have been saved. There was a day that I trusted Christ and He saved me. He delivered me. He rescued me. Some people can tell you the exact date. Some people can take you to the place where they got saved. But the new versions present a different view. A couple of three verses here, Acts 2.47, they use the term being saved. 1 Corinthians 1.18 in the New King James Bible, for the message of the cross is foolishness to them who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You're not being saved, you are saved, or you are not saved. 2 Corinthians 2.15, New King James, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved. The King James Bible uses the term saved. Those who are saved. And so it helps to clarify this idea of once you're saved, you're safe. We use a term when we describe eternal security. We use the term once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved, or always safe. I'll put that term there. Or you can say saved. Once saved, always saved. It's something that has happened. He saved you. And so you want to understand the idea of eternal security. It's the work, and I'm quoting from a theologian, a good definition, Charles Ryrie. The work of God which guarantees that the gift of salvation once received is possessed forever and cannot be lost. That's the idea of eternal security. To be secure. Don't you want to have some security in the most important detail of law, which is your eternal soul? This idea of, I hope I'm saved and maybe I'll make it, that's a terrible way to live. And when you study and when you talk to people that uh, have this idea that they can lose their salvation, they do not have peace. They live their life in fear, and if they're in churches where they try to retread or they try to get people resaved, they're constantly bringing up different sins. And did you really repent when you repented? And maybe you're really not saved. If you fell, if you backslid, you lost it. How do you know you didn't lose it in one of your dreams last night? And so you talk about fear, you talk about a lack of joy, you talk about a lack of peace, you talk about a lack of love and of security in their salvation. It's a terrible way to live. There's no peace. And so we're going to talk about this and we're going to give these scriptures to prove the Bible doctrine. This has to do with the objective material. The Bible doctrine of the fact of eternal security, eternal salvation. Now let me preface it with this. When we go through these verses, we're going to keep in mind the dispensational context. You say, what do you mean by that? A dispensation has to do with a manner or method in which God deals with and dispenses truth to people during different covenants that He operates in. For example, in the Old Testament, God told the Jews to keep the Decalogue, Deca, the Ten, the Ten Commandments. He had the Levitical law set up with all of the rules and regulation and rituals and ceremonies and rites. And those Jews had to keep those things. In Deuteronomy 6 verse 25, he says, It shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all the things that are written therein. That was God's truth for that people in that covenant. And so when we begin to talk about verses on eternal security, we're not going to go to the Old Testament law and find verses to back up eternal security. We're also not going to go to some of the transition places like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John during the time when technically they're still under the Old Testament and they're leading up to the New Testament. Matthew 19, a man asked Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? He says, if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. That's not what Paul said when a guy said in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you want to make sure you understand that all of the Bible is for you, but all of the Bible is not written directly to you. So I want to preface this because this will help you if you're grabbing and grasping at verses that seem to teach you can lose your salvation. You want to make sure you examine them in their dispensational context. Who is this verse talking to? You say, well, I found this verse over there in the book of Hebrews, and it says, you know, we have this confidence if we're steadfast and we hold on with hope until the end, and, and if we fall away, it's impossible to renew them into repentance. And you start going through there, you have to realize you're reading a book written to Hebrews. That's the name of the book, Hebrews. He says in chapter 1, in these last days. So you're dealing with a prophetic book, dealing with 
the Hebrews during the future Great Tribulation period, which Jesus Christ even mentioned some in His portions of prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, where He said, He that must endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Salvation is not always by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ in every dispensation. So that will help for you to understand the Bible does not contradict. So when you see those verses that seem to contradict, where one says, okay, um, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. Romans chapter number 8. You have everlasting life. When you see those verses and they seem to contradict other verses, you need to make sure you're not trying to put someone's mail in a different mailbox. And so when we deal with eternal security, we're going to deal with verses aimed at me and aimed at you after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, during this church age, before the rapture, before the great tribulation. We're not concerned with the millennial kingdom where people are going to be on the earth, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. If they call somebody a fool, they're in danger of the council. If they call somebody Reka or Raka, you don't even know what that means probably. But he says if they call them Raka, they're in danger of hell fire. Matthew chapter 5. Now, you've never called somebody a fool and been worried about it. Paul called the Corinthians fool and he called the Galatians fools. Galatians 3, 1 Corinthians 15. And so you want to make sure you understand the context of the passage. We're going to deal with verses that are aimed at believers in this age. And some of them are going to come from John's gospel because John wrote after he had Paul's revelation so there's material that is very applicable for the body of Christ in this age so you want to make sure you understand that's the verses we're going to be dealing with and so the Bible does not contradict at all we're not going to be so uh, arrogant and think that we can force eternal security for the entire Bible David after he committed adultery with Bathsheba he prayed Lord don't take my, the Holy Spirit from me he saw the Holy Spirit leave Saul the Bible says the Holy Spirit left Saul. David said, I don't want you to take the Holy Spirit because he knew in the Old Testament there was no sacrifice for the sin of adultery. What did God do? God made an exception with David. It's called the sure mercies of David. God forgave David. It was an exception that proved the rule. It didn't disprove the rule. You can't lose the Holy Spirit in this age. I'll give you verses in a minute on that. Enough introduction, I've got to get with these verses. So we're going to look at eternal security, and let's notice the proofs for eternal security. And the first one is that eternal life is a gift from God. Eternal life is a gift from God. And when God gives you a gift, He doesn't take it back. Romans 6.23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23. Ephesians 2.8 and 9, I quote it all the time. By grace are you saved through faith, and that other yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 11.29 says, The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Now you're in 1 John, come back to chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2, look down in verse number 25. Look in 1 John 2.25. And this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. If God gives you a gift, you think He's going to take it back? Now, you wouldn't give somebody a gift at Christmas time and then come January put a, a bill in the mail for that gift. That wouldn't be a gift. If they got the bill in the mail and it said payable, you know, and you have to pay this amount, it would cease being a gift. A gift is, here you go, do you want it? Take it. That's Jesus Christ, and if you want Him, you can take Him. It's a gift of God, and it's eternal life. God doesn't take a gift back. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. God is not a man that He should lie, neither the Son of Man that He should repent. Hath He not spoken, and shall He not do it? Hath He not uh, spoken, and shall He not make it good? Hath He not said, and shall He not do it? Hath He not spoken, and shall He not make it good? God does not lie. God gave you a gift. God's not going to take the thing back. Uh, then the second thing you want to notice, come over to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. And these are great verses. If you do not know some of these verses, you might want to jot them down. And you might want to commit some of these verses to memory. John chapter 3, we'll look at some of these. Everlasting life has no end. Everlasting life has no no end. Look in John chapter 3, look down in verse number 36. John chapter 3, look down in verse number 36. 
He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Everlasting life is never-ending life. That's what the word means, everlasting. You're in John chapter 3, turn over to chapter 5. There's several verses here in John. Look in chapter 5, look down in verse number 24. John 5, 24. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Did you notice those two things in John 3, 36 and John 5, 24? Everlasting life is said to be a present possession. Hath, H-A-T-H. If you've believed on Jesus Christ, you have everlasting life right now. Look over in chapter 6, John chapter 6. And so if you have everlasting life, everlasting life does not cease. You are plug, If you're saved, you are plugged into the eternal God. That's outside of time. We can't comprehend that. We're in time. But God's eternal. That's neither a past nor present nor future. It's just eternal. Look in John chapter number 6. John chapter 6, look down in verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath, present tense, everlasting life. Look in verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Come back over to 1 John chapter 5 where we started out. 1 John chapter number 5. If you're saved, you have Jesus Christ inside of you. If you're saved, you have everlasting life. Look in 1 John chapter number 5. Verse number 11. 1 John 5, 11. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Here's the proof right here. We're talking about facts. We're talking about being objective. This has nothing to do with your feelings. This has nothing to do with uh, the subjective reality that you are experiencing. This has to do with Bible fact, the record. If you've believed on Christ, this is the record. That's the proof. You have eternal life. Look in verse number 20. We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. You can't separate eternal life from Jesus Christ. All right, now let's look at the next one here. Number three, you are kept by God's power. I mentioned that briefly in my introductory comments. You're not saved by your own merit. You're not saved by, okay, I trusted Jesus and now I've got to work really, really hard to keep it. If you've got to work really, really hard to keep it, what makes you think you don't have to work really, really hard to get it? It's a crazy idea. If you can get to heaven by doing good, why did Jesus come down here and live a sinless life and die on the cross and rise again from the dead? You cannot keep yourself clean and not clean enough to go to heaven. You can be clean in front of men and you can be clean as far as when you compare it to some other dirt ball. But to try to say that you keep your own salvation is crazy. I'll give you the verse, 1 Peter 1.5. 1 Peter 1.5 who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Uh, come, back to, um, come back to John chapter number 10. This is a good verse if you don't know it already. John chapter number 10. Now, I know I may be going kind of fast. I want to be brief as I can. John chapter number 10. A very familiar passage here. John chapter number 10. Come down to verse 27. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. The idea is that He is holding on to you. And as we get a little further, the idea is that you are a part of His hand. Look over in Romans here. Romans chapter number 8. And if some of you are doubting your salvation, I hope these verses help you. Because there's no reason for you to doubt your salvation. Romans chapter number 8. 
If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are once saved, always saved, once saved, always safe. You have never-ending life. God is keeping you saved. There's nothing you can do to hinder or to stop you from going to heaven. Look in Romans chapter 8. People, people oftentimes ask, they say, well, isn't the, uh, if someone kills himself, isn't that the unpardonable sin? Well, tell me where that is in the Bible. You know, there's a man named Samson in the Old Testament. He killed himself. And he's mentioned in the heroes of the faith as a great man. He brought the house down on top of him and all the Philistines there. He's mentioned there in the heroes of the faith. Now think about it this way. I gave you this a couple of lessons back. In John chapter 16, he said, When the Holy Spirit has come, He will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. It's the sin of unbelief that sends somebody to hell. Somebody goes to hell because they refuse to take the cure. They don't go to hell because of the individual sins that they commit. It doesn't matter if they lived an upstanding life. Maybe they paid all their taxes. Maybe they took care of their family. Maybe they raised their kids right. Maybe they were a good employee. Maybe they were a good boss. Maybe they were an upstanding citizen. Maybe they gave thousands of dollars to charity. They did all these great humanitarian works. If they die an unbeliever, they go to hell. Here you have someone that gets saved, they trusted Christ as their personal Savior, and they go through a bout of depression, they get into a bad way, and they commit suicide. They go to heaven because they died a believer. It's that simple. Look in Romans chapter number 8. It's not what you do that gets you to heaven, it's what Jesus did that gets you to heaven. Romans chapter number 8. Come down, if you will, to um, verse number 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's pretty much all inclusive there. Nothing, no one, or no thing, not even your own sin, can separate you from the love of Christ. Your sin has been separated from your soul. Philippians 1.6 is a good verse. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If he saved your soul, he's going to keep your soul. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he talks about presenting your whole soul, body, and spirit blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And also 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 8, he mentions being blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. One more verse and we'll move on to the next one. John 6, 37, he says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. He will not cast you out. Now, let's look at this next one. Let me see how many more I have so I can make room. Um, number four, the believer is a child of of God. Or I should say you're in the family of God. When you trust Christ as your personal Savior, there are, there are several analogies that are used. The first one is in John chapter 1 and John chapter 3 and 1 Peter chapter 1. In John chapter 1, as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. And you're familiar with John chapter 3, Except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. So when you trust Christ, you're born into God's family. Being born again, 1 Peter 1, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now you're in his family. When you're born into a family, your DNA and RNA is set. You can go out and say, I disown my family, and the mom and dad can get mad at the kid, and the, as the adult grows up, the child grows up, they can move all the way across the world and not have anything to do with them, but it does not change the biological makeup that they are begotten of those two individuals. The second thing is adoption. Romans chapter 8, the Bible speaks of adoption. We are adopted by God into His family, and also in the book of Galatians. 
I'll give you Romans chapter 8 real quick. Romans chapter 8, verse number 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I'll back up to verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You get into a family by way of birth, but you can also get into a family by way of adoption. And in many cultures all throughout the history of man, there's been several cases where adoption landlocks it where you can never get out of that family. If you get an inheritance, the adopted child has full rights of inheritance. You get into a family by way of birth, by way of adoption, and also by way of being married into that family. And Paul, when he speaks to the Corinthians, he said, I present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. We are typified in the Bible as the bride of Christ. I'll give the verse to you, 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. He says in verse number 2, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin. You're in the family. You've been born into his family. You've been adopted into his family. And you're going to stand in front of him. The Bible calls it the marriage of the Lamb, Revelation chapter number 19, Ephesians chapter number 5. He talks about the husband and wife, but then he says... This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You're going to stand up there and marry. Here is your birth certificate. 1 John chapter 5. This is the record. This, this, is obje this is nothing objectional here. These are objective facts. If you've trusted Christ, you have a birth certificate. If you've trusted Christ, you have adoption papers. The Bible. The record. If you trusted Christ, this is your espousal. You've already went and got the marriage license. You just hadn't consummated the marriage yet because your, your bridegroom hadn't come to get you yet. But he's coming back, and I hope it's real soon. And he's going to take us home, and we're going to have a, a marriage in the sky, and we're going to come back, and we're going to have a honeymoon for a thousand-year period. And so we are in the family. That is proof that you have eternal salvation. You can't get out of the family. Now, the next thing you want to notice, you'll turn to Ephesians chapter number 5, and it's similar to this, uh, point number 4, but this one is that you are in the body of Christ. You are a part of Jesus Christ. And I mentioned that we are the bride, and He is the bridegroom, but look over in Ephesians chapter number 5, as the analogy gets closer. Ephesians chapter number 5, come down if you will. To verse number 23. Ephesians 5, 23. How do you know you're saved? How do you know that you're eternally kept? I am inside Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is inside me. That's pretty good. If I go to hell, Jesus Christ would have to go to hell because I'm part of Him. Look in Ephesians chapter 5. You say, do you understand that? No, I don't. That's why the Bible calls it a mystery here. This is one of the mysteries. But I believe it. God said it. It's fact. You can't object to this. This is something here that is, you stand back, it's not based on feeling, it's based on fact. It's in the Bible. Ephesians 5.23 For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Look at this, verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Same thing in 1 Corinthians Chapter number 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. We are part of Jesus Christ. When you were saved, you were baptized into His body. Jesus Christ alluded to this over in John 14, 15, and 16. He said, if I'll go away, I'll send the Comforter. He may abide with you forever. We speak of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. and That is when you are placed into the body of Jesus Christ. Now, you're, you're in Ephesians, flip back, take a left turn to Romans. Let's kind of tie your adoption and being part of his body together. Look over in Romans chapter number 8. 
You're the body of Christ. The believer will be like Christ. Look over in Romans chapter number 8. When he mentions the adoption, he's talking about the adoption which is the redemption of our body. Look in Romans chapter number 8. When you come down to 14, 15, 16, he's dealing with adoption. If children, then heirs. Look in verse number 18. I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. You see that. And you come all the way down. You'll notice... In verse number 19, the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. In other words, when the sons of God are going to be manifest. Now this coincides with 1 John chapter 3. I think I'll wait and we'll turn to that in just a minute. But it talks about us seeing Him and being like Him. In other words, you are a son of God, but you walk around in the earth kind of like Jesus said in John chapter number 3. The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You can't just look at somebody on the outside and say, Oh, that person's saved, that person's saved, that person's not saved. That... You can't tell on the outside. But there's coming a day when that's going to be manifested. And the whole creation's waiting for the event to take place where Jesus Christ will call His bride home and all the events that are foretold in Bible prophecy will unfold and then Jesus Christ will return to this earth and He will redeem creation. All the destructive uh, geological disturbances that take place during the Great Tribulation, all the, the animal violence, all the, the catastrophe that takes place will all be quieted. And this world is waiting for that. This world is groaning for that. You think about this world and, and, and animals and so forth, the animal kingdom, they have to survive by way of death of others, even us. And so that is going to be a relief for the whole creation. Keep reading down, verse number 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. That has to do when your body is changed at the rapture, and your body is going to be made like unto Christ. Come down to verse number 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now turn over to uh, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. I gave you some stuff on predestination before. It's four times in the Bible. And it never refers to this idea that God picked some before the foundation of the world to be saved and some before the foundation of the world to be lost. Predestination in the Bible, 1 John chapter 3 is where we're going. Predestination in the Bible has to do with a believer who has made a conscious choice to trust Christ. God has fixed his destination. He's fixed his destination in relationship to his body. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. When you got saved, your body didn't get saved. Your soul got saved. Your spirit was born again. And there's coming a day when He's going to redeem these bodies. That's called the redemption of our body. And that's when the adoption will be completed. The purchased possession has been finally realized at the rapture. Look in 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love, verse 1. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself, even as He is pure. So we're going to be like Him. Another verse that goes along with this is Philippians 3. Verses 20 and 21, our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Your vile body will be changed like His. No more sickness, no more suffering, no more sin. You will be made just like Christ. You're predestinated to be conformed to His... You're fi it's fixed. You have eternal security. 
Now let me give you this last one. I think it's the last one that I'm going to give you. We could probably give you several, several more. The last one is that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now this ties in to the last one we gave you because you have, if you'll go over to um, Ephesians chapter number 1, you have the Holy Spirit inside when you trusted Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit came in. And you say, well, I don't always feel the Holy Spirit. Well, that's not His fault. It's your fault. The Bible commands you to be filled with the Spirit, not Him. You say, well, do I need to pray for it? Well, you can, but just holding up your arms, you know, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me. That's not in the Bible. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Quote the verse right. Don't quote it wrong. Well, I can have a little drink as long as it's not... As long as I don't drink in excess, that ain't what it says. The excess is in the wine. You don't need to drink any of it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, negative, positive, be filled with the Spirit. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, there are certain things you don't need to do. There are certain things you should do. Negative and positive. Dump out the bad, put in the good. Put off the old man, put on the new man. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be filled with the Spirit. It's not His fault, it's your fault. If you don't always feel it, it's not, it doesn't mean that you do not have the Holy Spirit, though. You can be so far away from God, you don't feel Him knocking at your heart anymore. But if you're saved, you're sealed. For, look in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 1 first. Now, I mentioned this verse in passing real quickly, so you probably didn't catch it. 2 Corinthians 1.22. He mentions the earnest of the Spirit. And he talks about the purchased possession. 2 Corinthians 1.22, who hath sealed us and give us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. He has purchased, uh, purchased us. That's called redemption. We studied that when we studied the theories of salvation. We've been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. But the adoption hasn't been complete yet, so therefore the body hasn't been saved yet. There's a part of you that's not, hadn't been taken home. He's put down some earnest money. What's the earnest money? The earnest or the down payment is the Holy Spirit. And He put the Holy Spirit inside of your heart and He has sealed you. The part of you that, say, that He saved cannot touch the part of you that's not saved. The part of you that's not saved is your flesh. The part of you that is saved is your spirit. It's been born again. Your soul has been saved. That can't be corrupted by your flesh. Thank God for that. If it could be corrupted, you would lose your salvation. You'd go to hell. That's how you know that eternal security is for the church age because it's after the resurrection of, the Christ, of Jesus Christ, John 7, 37, and 38, that He promises to give the Holy Spirit in that sense. The Holy Spirit was not yet given, John 7, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Nobody in the Old Testament could have the sealing work of the Holy Spirit applied to them because Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead. So the idea of somebody trying to teach eternal security in the Old Testament is crazy. Now, look in Ephesians chapter 1. If you're saved, you're sealed. You're preserved. Don't worry about perseverance of the saints. You have preservation of the saints. Ephesians 1.13 In whom you trusted, excuse me, Ephesians 1.13 In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What's the promise got to do with? Turn, look over in Ephesians 4. It's all connected. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. He's put the down payment down. You got the thing in the pawn shop. You put the thing in. There's a payment. You're going to redeem it. He has put the down payment, the Holy Spirit, inside of us. He's going to purchase that possession. He's going to redeem that possession. And there's a promise. And that promise is, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And you are sealed unto the rapture. You can't lose your salvation. Now, that's that. That's the objective part. Now, just a few minutes left and we will finish with assurance of salvation. What is assurance of salvation? Obviously, that is subjective. You might feel it and you might not. It has to do with the realization that a person has eternal life. This deals with feeling. This deals with a sense or an experience that one is saved. Now, if your salvation is not settled, 
you can't have peace, and therefore you can't practice what the Bible commands you to practice. He says, by everything by prayer and supplication. Well, he says, be careful for nothing, but by everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. Be careful for nothing. If you don't have eternal security settled, and you don't have a no-so salvation, you can't experience the peace, and you're going to be filled with trepidation. You're going to be filled with fear and anxiety. And so the assurance of salvation can't be experienced. Now there's some reasons people, believers, don't have assurance. And I'll give you these. Some reasons believers don't have assurance. They can't point to a specific time that they got saved. They can't point to a specific time. Maybe they got saved when they were real young and they don't remember even the month that it was in. And they have doubts and they, they don't have it nailed down. It's not real concrete and, and they have problems with their assurance of salvation. Uh, number two, one of the reasons a lot of people have a problems with assurance of salvation has to do with the procedure or the manner of how they were saved. Okay? What does that mean? Well, uh, the preacher might have given an invitation at the church and he said, if you want to trust Christ as your personal Savior, please slip out of your seat and come forward. Or someone might have said, why don't you pray this a particular prayer, and so, so on and so forth. And so they have questions regarding whether that procedure was correct. Did I pray all the right things when I prayed? The preacher said, in the best way you know how, ask Jesus Christ to save you. And, you know, maybe here's a person that hasn't prayed maybe in 15 years. Maybe they never prayed to God. And they trip and they stumble and they don't know exactly what to say. So therefore they doubt the manner in which they went through the steps that I gave you last time of repentance and receiving Christ. Here's what you want to understand with this. Really with both of these. Here's the question. Are you saved or are you not? What are you trusting in? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ or have you, have you not? I haven't asked you about when and where it happened yet. Just answer the question. You say, yeah, I do believe Jesus Christ died for me. I'm not trusting in my good works. I'm not trusting in baptism. I'm not trusting in none of that. I'm only trusting in the death, burial, blood of Christ. That's all I'm trusting in. Okay, the procedure doesn't matter. I firmly believe this. The procedure just has to do with helping people with assurance. The specific point in time has to do with helping people with assurance. And that's all that that is. If you say, okay, if you want to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, why don't you slip out of your seat? And if the gospel has already been given and the person understands the gospel and they are turning from their sins and they are turning from their pride, they're turning from their religion, they're turning from their self-righteousness, that whole stuff of repentance that we dealt with. And they are receiving Christ and they believe He died for them. They're saved before they ever get down to the altar. They're saved before they ever repeat a prayer. But there's nothing wrong in helping people have assurance. The danger is, just like I pointed out before, is people begin to look to certain things. They say, oh, I was saved because I was baptized. Oh, I was saved because I prayed a prayer. I was saved because I walked down the aisle of the church. You want to be careful with that. Number three, people have problems with assurance because of certain sins. Now, everybody has a sin problem, but some people have certain sins that creep in, and maybe it's bad things that they've never done before, or maybe it's old habits they had before they made a profession of faith, and now they think, you know, I never was, I, I never was saved. And they don't understand the difference between the old man and the new man. I gave you a little bit of it earlier. The old man still has the old desires. The old man still wants to do bad. The new man on the inside doesn't want to do bad. And there's a struggle going on. But they don't understand that necessarily. So therefore they think, I never was saved to start with. Or they get confused and they begin to doubt that they can be saved. And so you have to understand... This can affect your fellowship. This can affect your joy. And then you say, well, I must not be saved. Nobody could do the things that I do and be saved. 
Let me go ahead and say this, not giving you a license to sin, but a saved person can do anything any unsaved person can do. You are depraved. Your flesh is depraved. Paul said, I know that in me, Romans chapter 7, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Here's another problem, number four. People have a lot of problems with assurance because they base their salvation on an experience instead of faith. Now in this category you may have people that aren't saved. When I talk about having assurance of salvation, there are people that aren't saved. They shouldn't have an assurance. You know, there are some people that aren't saved, but they walk around thinking that everything's good because they were baptized. Or everything's good because they were went to a certain church, or they were baptized as a baby, or they took the communion, or they did the confession, or, or whatever it is, or they said a prayer, or their daddy's a preacher. Whatever the thing may be, they have a false assurance. Some people base salvation on experience. Now here's the danger. You also have people that are saved, and when they got saved, it was a very emotional and dramatic thing. And then they got out of fellowship with God, and they're not having that dramatic experience on a daily basis, so therefore they think they have lost their salvation, or something was wrong and they never were saved to start with. Danger, dangerous ground when you begin to base your salvation on your feelings and on your experience. Your feelings will fluctuate. God's Word never changes. And then finally, and I dealt with this enough, I won't really have to deal with this. Um, they misapply Scripture. In other words, they take verses out of their dispensational context, verses that are aimed at someone in the Old Testament, verses that may be aimed at someone in the future tribulation period, which do indeed teach that they can lose their salvation because their salvation is not by faith and grace in the finished work of Jesus Christ. There are elements of works and so forth involved. Therefore, they go to the book of James. They go to the book of Hebrews. They may go in some places in the book of Acts where you're still dealing with a transition. And they may go to some places in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where you're dealing with a transition or even the Old Testament. And then they get confused and now they think that they have lost their salvation or they have to do certain things in order to keep their salvation. Therefore, they don't have peace and they don't have assurance of salvation. Let's close with our verse we started in, 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter 5. It's good to know the plan of salvation, but I hope that you know that you're saved. I hope you have the assurance that you are saved. You say, well, you know, I don't feel saved. Well, you might not always feel saved, but do you know that you're saved? Have you trusted Christ as your personal Savior? You say, well, I can't name the date and the hour. What are you counting on to get you to heaven? Are you counting on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Have you believed on Jesus Christ? You know that it's His blood that made atonement for your soul, that He lived the life you couldn't live. He died for... Do you believe that? Okay. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have been written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Some of you, you've been going back and forth with this thing, and you've been doubting God's Word. You need to pray and say, Lord... Please forgive me for doubting your word. I know I'm saved because I'm trusting you. And if you're watching this and you've never nailed it down for sure, but you do believe in Jesus Christ, why don't you nail it down right now? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I'm going to write this date down. I am trusting you and I know what your Bible says. I'm believing on Jesus Christ. I'm putting this date down. I know that I'm saved. Give me assurance and peace that I can know that I'm saved. Lord, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the peace of God that comes from the infallible, inerrant word of God. We appreciate your love for us and giving us everlasting life. And God, I pray that you might encourage those that are listening, those that may be doubting their salvation, or those that maybe they're not saved, that they would nail it down for sure today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.